Uh, hey, good morning. Um, my name's Courtney, and I just wanted to welcome you on this Friday. Um, just welcome all my friends. Welcome back if you were here with me last week, and welcome to my new friends if this is your first time. Um, it's actually been super beautiful out this week, so I hope that you've been able to get out on some walks and maybe ride your bikes around or, you know, pull out that sidewalk chalk. Um, yeah, it's just been super um, beautiful out, and I'm thankful for that. Um, and I'm also thankful that you are here joining us today. Um, I'm so glad that you are able to hang out with us for a little bit as we learn a little bit more about Jesus and even why we're here on a Friday. It's kind of weird, but we have a lesson for you that's going to explain it all. But first, we're going to hear from another one of our teachers. Good morning, City Gates kids. It's Tanya here, and I just wanted to say hi to all of you, to the toddlers and preschoolers. Hi, it's so nice to have you with us today. Um, all the JKs and SKs, how are you doing? Um, grade ones to threes, are you there? <laughs> and the grade fours to sixes, hey. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say hi to all of you and hope you're doing well. I know it's strange to be meeting like this on screens and maybe you're visiting with your friends through screens and FaceTime. But um, just know that one day we'll see each other again and we look forward to that. If you're new here today and we've never met you before, we also hope that you enjoy this morning with us. And we hope that we will get to meet you one day in person. But I also just want to send out a special hello to the grade sevens and eights. Um, I don't know if you guys are watching this with your siblings or if you're going to be watching the service with your parents. Um, but I just wanted to say hi to Nick and Aaron and Sam and Amber. And um, yeah, we miss you guys too. And I know that we were going to have a special time together on the 15th of March when everything changed and we couldn't meet together anymore. So we will have time together again soon. But for now, I hope you guys are keeping well. Know that God loves you and he's with you through this time. And um, on this Good Friday, I just hope that you will all know God's presence. Um, that he laid his life down for you. And that that's the best thing that anyone could do for anyone. The best friend we could ever have is somebody that gave his life for us. And I hope that you will come to know Jesus as your best friend through this time. Sending lots of love to all of you. We miss you. Hey, I'm Marshall. And I'm Anna, and it's such a privilege for us to be with you on Good Friday. Absolutely. Today is the day that we slow down and take a look at how Jesus gave his life for us. So why don't we check in with Bruxy and hear a little bit more about this moment that forever changed the way we would experience God's love. Watch this. We are in the middle of a series called The Rock because it's about Jesus and he is the rock solid foundation that we build our lives on. Rather than shifting sand, when we follow Jesus, he gives us something firm that will change how we live. Hi friends, I'm Brexy, and today we're talking about an event that is at the same time the worst and the best thing that ever happened. It is very unloving in one way and terribly cruel, and yet it is the most loving thing we could focus on on Good Friday, a day where we talk about a lot of sadness and pain, and yet ultimately we know it's good. So here's today's big idea. Jesus' death rocked heaven and earth. Jesus was leading a movement that was starting to catch on. It was spreading. Thousands of people were coming to listen to his teaching. Now this was an amazing and beautiful movement of love and forgiveness and kindness. But at the same time, a certain group of people did not like it. They were the religious leaders and the religious leaders of Jesus' day wanted things to stay exactly the way they had always been. So the religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus to maybe even get him killed. Well, they had to figure out where Jesus was going to be later 
late at night when he was by himself away from the crowds. And in order to do that, they talked to one of his disciples, Judas, who betrayed Jesus for some money. So Judas led the religious leaders and some soldiers to arrest Jesus late at night in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus had gone with his disciples to pray. Now, it was late at night. How would they know which one was Jesus and not one of his disciples? Well, Judas arranged a sign. Judas walked up to Jesus like he was his friend and gave him a kiss, maybe a kiss on each cheek. It's the way they would greet each other in that day. But it was a kiss of betrayal. He was showing the soldiers who to arrest and they took Jesus right away. They took him to the religious leaders first. Caiaphas was the high priest. But he, of course, said, I condemn Jesus. I do not want his movement to succeed. And so then they took him to the Roman leader, the governor, Pilate. They needed his permission. Pilate would be the one to finally order the execution. Pilate interviewed Jesus and said, but there's nothing wrong with this man. He's a good man. But the people wouldn't listen to Pilate and now Pilate had a problem. He tried to save Jesus' life in a way that gave them a choice. He said, listen, I've got this other terrible criminal here named Barabbas and I've got Jesus. Who would you really want me to release to you? Thinking they would choose Jesus, but they shouted, Barabbas, Barabbas. So Pilate shouted back, what do you want me to do with Jesus? This time they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate didn't want a revolt. And so even though he knew Jesus was an innocent man, he went ahead and did what the religious leaders were shouting for. He crucified Jesus. Before he did, the Roman soldiers made fun of him. They mocked him. They said, are you really a king? Uh, we'll put a crown on your head, but it'll be a crown of thorns, a crown of pain and suffering. Uh, we'll put a robe on you and a royal scepter, which was just a regular stick, and we'll put you on your throne, but his throne was a cross. We'll even put a sign above your head that says, this is Jesus, King of the Jews, as a way of making fun of Jesus and the Jewish people all at the same time. And when they put Jesus on the cross, something interesting happened. From about noon till three in the afternoon, it got really dark, and then out of that darkness from the cross, Jesus cried out something strange. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which being translated means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then something happened that has never happened since and had never happened before, something absolutely amazing. We read about it in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51 and under. At that moment, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. After Jesus was raised from the dead, they went into the holy city and they appeared to many people. The Roman commander and those guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened and they were terrified. They exclaimed, he was surely the son of God. Did you catch that? There was an earthquake and tombs broke open and people who were dead came back to life. It was like there was this shock wave of pure life that came through the death of Jesus. The blast waves went out and dead people were affected. It's like a promise that all of us can, can receive the power of new life through Jesus's death. And did you notice the curtain was torn from top to bottom? It's as though God himself is the one doing the tearing to say, now there's no barrier between me and everyone else. You can come in close to my heart and I can come and be where you are. And Jesus is the one who brings us and God together. And that's why Good Friday is really good, even though something really sad happened. This is the day that we saw all of this happen most clearly. This is about the love that absolutely rocked heaven and earth. It's been great talking about Jesus with you. I'm Bruxy. Peace. Wow, it is tough to hear what Jesus went through, but amazing that he gave his life for us. Yeah, and he expressed his love in a way that changed the world forever. And it's so true. Like the big idea said, Jesus' death rocked heaven and earth. He didn't stay dead. He came back to life and removed the barrier between God and us. And that is so amazing. It really is. Well, it's time to break off into our small groups. So let's talk about what this looks like in our lives. See ya. Wow, that was so great. Um, thank you to our friends over at the Meeting House that um, were able to you know, provide this awesome curriculum for us. Um, but now we also have a chance for um, us to download some coloring sheets for today. And I actually have one of my friends, Liam, that's gonna join us and color along with us. I hope you enjoy it. Hey 
everyone, it's Liam, coming at you with a good old quarantine classic, uh, coloring, and I'm gonna be doing my coloring on a computer. This one right here. Let's do it.
Well, good morning to you and welcome to City Gates. Uh, good Friday morning to you. Uh, my name is Toby and a special welcome to you if you uh, are not typically uh, joining us on a Sunday and you're new to this idea of live streaming a church service. This Friday is special because we as Christians join millions of Christians around the world to remember what Jesus has done on the cross. And to remind us of that, as we so often do, we're going to sing a few songs. And uh, so I want you to just join us. And uh, there's going to be lyrics on the screen. I'm going to invite Brian right now to lead us in that time. City Gates Online again. Um, just a reminder, just like last week, I recommend um, just sort of taking a different posture if you're kind of slouched back on the couch. It's probably a good idea to stand. And, um, yeah, today is Good Friday or Great Friday as we're calling it. And uh, so we're just going to sing because of that. And uh, yeah, so feel free to sing along in your living rooms, um, either by yourself or with your family. Just join in singing and know that we're all singing at the same time, even though you can't hear everybody. <laughs> Before the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea Great our priest whose name is love Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in heaven he stands No tongue can bid me thence depart Tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. But would I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin? Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. Oh God, the just is satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me Behold Him there, the risen Lamb my perfect spotless righteousness The great unchangeable I am The King of glory and of grace What in himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by his blood My life is hid with Christ on high Christ my Savior and my God Christ my Savior and my God spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me 
Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God oh. your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, oh, you paid it been so, so kind to me. I know the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I know it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down A lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up A mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down A lie you won't tear down coming after me no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leads the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. No, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed, sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood acute, beaten, mocked, and scorned, and bowing to the Father's 
when he took the crown of thorns and oh that rugged cross my salvation where you love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor run to thee sent from heaven god's own son to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree and know oh, that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. And whom the sun sets free, oh it's free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spill now the curse of sin has no hold on me and soon the sun sets free oh it's free indeed oh that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor run to thee praise and honor run to thee So, <clears throat> Father, we, um, we thank you. Even as we um, feel the distance of being apart from one another, perhaps we feel the distance of this event that happened 2,000 years ago, Jesus, that you walked on this earth and then that you died a death on this cross. And uh, we want to remember that this morning because it has a major and significant impact on the world today. And uh, Lord, help us to do that through the words of the, the songs we just sang and in the moments that we'll have together now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, good morning again. My name is Toby and uh, welcome to you again on this uh, great Friday and this Easter weekend. We hope that you will not only join us today, but on Sunday as well. And you can feel free to uh, say hi on the on the comment section um, on the side there. Just before I hand over to Vic, I'm going to go through a few uh, announcements uh, for us as a community. And so you can listen in and look on the screen. So again, welcome to you, especially this is your first time with us as CityGates Online. You can let us know a little bit more about yourself at citygates.ca slash guest. You can fill in some of your details there and uh, we'll get in contact with you. You can let us know about how this experience was and we promise we won't spam you or anything. So please uh, do do that if you are new here today. 
Uh, next, this is for our regular members uh, and attenders. Uh, your faithful giving for the operation of this church uh, is is um, as um, still a major act of faith, and uh, particularly in this time. So, thank you for those who are continuing to do that. You can, of course, do that online at our website slash giving. You can also do that via text uh, right from your phone. So, thank you for that. Uh, next, for many years, we have been serving. Uh, the residents at Winborn Park, a long-term care facility not far from us. And of course, given the circumstances, we cannot uh, go in the facility and care for them. However, uh, as we've gotten in contact uh, with them and we continue this kind of, they've said, we can serve them actually by dropping off cards and, and writing cards to the residents inside to encourage them to say hello, to say, we're thinking about you, we're praying for you. And so we want to, as a community, do that. Uh, adults and particularly children, um, and you can do that by doing that at home and then dropping off a card at the waypoint. We have actually a mail slot in the front door. You can just, at your convenience, drop that off inside the box. And if you do that by April 18th, we're going to gather them all together and then drop it off for the residents. So this is, uh, again, for, for all of you, but particularly for, for families and children, it'd be great to, to make a few cards, drawings, pictures, all, all those kinds of things to let them know that we are still caring for them and we are still thinking about them. Uh, just the next slide. Uh, this is uh, particularly for our City Gates members. Uh, in this time, as we are separate and we are apart, we still uh, want to know how you're doing. And we have created this uh, survey, you can see here at our website, slash survey. You can fill it in anonymously. And we just want to get a sense of how you're doing in this time and how we can even better serve you uh, through this season. Uh, next up. Alpha. Alpha is a video series that that really answers the big questions of life, and in particular, the significance of Jesus as we celebrate this weekend. Typically, that was done in person. We shared a meal. We watched a video. There was a discussion. Well, we are actually going to take that online, like so many things we're doing today. And you can do that uh, by signing up at citygates.ca slash alpha. The, the idea is to, we're aiming for the end of April. So if you have a friend and, and they're asking questions, this would be a great place for them to go. If you're here and you're wondering and, and, and you're going to have some questions, this is also a place where you can go and discuss further the things of the questions of life and the questions about who this Jesus is. And finally, uh, do join us uh, on Super Sunday. That's just two days from now. We're going to be here uh, live, I'm uh, sorry, online again. Um, our kids program starts at 1030. We're going to start that. And then at 11 a.m., we will see you here. And I believe that's it for me. And I'm going to welcome Vic. Well, uh, good morning to you uh, on this great Friday. Uh, thank you so much, Toby, for getting us through those announcements, those notices. Um, if you haven't met me yet, my name is Vic, uh, and I'm one of the leaders at City Gates. Uh, and I'm also so thrilled that you uh, could spend time with us this morning. Um, for many, uh, Easter weekend is about bunnies, uh, but for Christians, it's actually about blood. In particular, Good Friday, as we've uh, relabeled it, Great Friday. Uh, Easter for many is about empty Easter eggs, hollow Easter eggs. But for Christians, uh, it's about an empty tomb. And so uh, we're going to journey together today and figure out exactly why, over the ages, people have called this day good. Um, I think... As Christmas is the day that we, uh, or the season that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, it's his birthday. In many ways, Good Friday is Jesus' death day. It's a strange thing to be celebrating because here's the, here's the fact, here's the reality, is that we celebrate and commemorate the brutal murder of an innocent man through torture on a Roman cross nearly 2,000 years ago. Um, that's quite something that's unique. And so to make matters even more confusing, uh, city gators have chosen to take it from you know, Good Friday to Great Friday. Now, if that is the case, then either that's something really sick and uh, we should be frowned upon, or this day is in fact very significant. 
Um, and I believe that his death does carry serious significance, which is why we don't just call it good, we've upgraded it to great. And to help us make sense of that, we're actually going to read some accounts from the Gospels on uh, and about the crucifixion of Jesus. And so I'd love for you to journey with me. The first bit will be out of Luke chapter 23, and then we'll jump to Mark chapter 15. Um, but as I read these verses, you can obviously follow along with me up on the screen. Luke chapter 23, I'm going to read from verse 35 through 43. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, that is Jesus, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's read Mark's account from chapter 15, verse 33 to 39. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. This is God's word. Holy Spirit, help us now as we journey through these verses, help us to Learn why this day is so great for us, even though it was so gruesome for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to break today. I'm just really into three sections. I'm just going to zoom into sort of three aspects of those passages. And the first one has got to do with breath. Breathing his last is what we see in Mark 15, 39. Was that his last breath? And if that is the case, why was it significant? Well, let's stop for a while and just think about uh, the significance of this. Jesus himself said that he was the bread of life and living water. When he spoke to his disciples and to the crowds that gathered him, those were the claims he made about himself. And those were profound statements because in those days, bread and water, man, it mattered a lot. For many people, it was a matter of life and death whether you had access to bread and water. You know, the... The, uh, the clever people say that you could, you know, maybe with three to five days, uh, you could hang out without water, and then after that, you will die. Uh, with food, it's a little longer, you know, maybe 40 days and plus after that, without food, you'd die. But, but water is pretty significant, and so Jesus said he's the living water and he's the bread of life. But when we start thinking about breath, just as we read here about Jesus breathing out his last, Actually, that's serious life when we think about breathing. We're not talking about days like without bread, without uh, water and food. We are talking about minutes. We are talking about seconds without breath. Just missing a few of those really brings life into perspective. I just think of when I grew up, I, I struggled with childhood asthma. And I remember moments where I really struggled to breathe. And in those moments, I was petrified and anxious and, and, and really felt like I was at death's door. 
Uh, and maybe you've experienced choking of some, some nature where you, 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 you were not able to breathe and, and, and just you realize that moment is not something very trivial. Actually, it's a matter of life and death. And I even just think about this, this really challenging season that we're in where many people who are infected with COVID-19 are literally fighting for their next breath. Uh, this unfortunate uh, turn of events, this virus affects the lungs and in the worst case, it does kill people by suffocation. And um, that's why there's such a huge need uh, for those medical equipments, the, uh, the ventilators uh, to be made. Uh, and so it's, it's more relevant than ever as we think about breathing out and in in order to sustain and to be alive. And in Genesis chapter 2, if we rewind just to the story where, where the breathing of mankind began, in, in verse 7 in chapter 2, it tells us that God breathed into man, formed him out of the dust of the earth, and then he breathed into his nostrils, his life, and he breathed him in many ways into existence. And then you carry on reading the Old Testament and you see that the covenant name of God, when God revealed himself to his people, the, uh, we pronounce it and we say it Yahweh, but it's a very difficult word to pronounce. We have thrown vowels into this word, which is spelt Y-H-W-H. You can write it down and figure it out. Not easy to pronounce, so we throw the vowels in so we could say it, but without the vowels, it actually sounds more like breath. Sounds like a, like a, like a cough in many ways than a word. And I find it fascinating because human beings breathe between 17 and 23,000 times a day. It all depends on how fit you are, I, I guess, or how, uh, how, um, how much you're exerting yourself. Um, but if that is the case, that the very name of God that he revealed himself to in Scripture and the very first thing he did into, into human beings, breathing into them, and, and, and we breathe unbeknown to us even, it's this, this, this involuntary action in many ways. We could be saying the, the name of God over and over again without us even knowing it. Many people are uttering the name of God just as they go about acknowledging that the very breath in their lungs and the, the very life they have should be accredited and attributed to the grace of God. And so breathing is quite significant. And on the cross we see and we read here, Jesus gave up his spirit, as some scriptures say. He, he breathed out his last. And you see that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in John. All of those accounts uh, uh, frame that moment for us, all of the Gospels. And so there's the significance that I said. God breathed into Adam and Eve, our first parents. He gave life to them in Genesis. And then Adam, as we carry on reading in the, in the beginning story of mankind, he messes that up. He actually chooses death over life. God said to him, listen, to be safe, stay away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can eat of anything, but I am your Lord. I'm your God. I, I am in charge and, and live like that. So avoid that tree. But here's the tree of life. You can eat from that. I believe eternal life was theirs then. He said, if you, if you, if you obey me, you will live. You will have life. But if not, you will taste death. And we know what our first parents did. Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They wanted to be autonomous. They didn't want to do what God wanted them to do. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. And so they brought death into creation. And they spoiled it for us. And ever since then, people have been dying as a proof, as a consequence of that first sin. And so here we see in the account of the Gospels that God once again had to breathe out, just like he breathed into Adam and Eve to give them life. Once again, he had to breathe out, but this time it was to end his own life to give eternal life back to his creation. It's a profound moment when Jesus breathed out his last. He gave up his breath so that we could breathe again. You know, God said to, that, to Adam, the first Adam, he said, if you obey me, you will live and the Bible paints Jesus in this, this light. It, it, it calls him the second Adam because the curse was entered in and came through the first Adam disobeying. But Jesus is the obedient second Adam to reverse the curse that the first Adam brought. And so God said to the first Adam, if you obey me, you will live. And then he says to Jesus, the second Adam, if you obey me, you will die. Because Jesus came with a mission 
The cross wasn't some sort of mess, messed up plan that, that sort of hijacked what God wanted to do. It was his plan, his purpose. The father said to, to the son, Jesus, would you go? Would you lay your life down? And Jesus agreed. And so the reality is he said to him, if you obey me, you will die. So different from what he said to the first Adam, if you obey me, you will live. And that is the case. Jesus did die to reverse that curse. Our disobedience, because we side with Adam, the first Adam, our disobedience led to death, but his obedience, Jesus' obedience, led to death too, so that our disobedience, which led to death, could be reversed and we could experience life again. What is this life that I'm talking about? You know, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, I'm the living water. Well, it's a relationship with Him. It's a relationship with God. It's to be reconciled with God again. What broke in the Garden of Eden, when Adam disobeyed, Jesus came to fix and to bring us back into that relationship with God where He is the bread and the water that our souls long for and need to be sustained on. And, and, and we can live eternally with Him and for Him. That is the life that He's offered. And so that brings me to the second section. We see in Mark chapter 15, that Jesus speaks about being forsaken. He was actually, he experienced a disconnection from the Father. And in many ways, he experienced what Adam experienced in that garden as he sinned and was separated and banished out of the garden, away from the tree of life. Jesus on that tree of death experienced that as he was forsaken. What was going on there? Brett McCracken, uh, a friend of ours, of our church from California, he, he wrote this in one of his books. He says, a, a Jesus who suffered is a Jesus we can know. Because if we know anything in this world, it's suffering. Those are such relevant words even for uh, uh, humanity, you know, as they find themselves in this strange season all across the planet. You know, he can identify with those who su suffer a and we can know him. He, he, it's amazing. Jesus isn't like some of those untouchable, out of touch celebrities with perfect lives that we long to, you know, to be like. No, Jesus entered into our brokenness as he's on that cross suffering. He can identify with us who suffer. And it's an amazing thing. And, and the suffering of Jesus um, is described in the Gospels in vivid ways. Um, we have sung about some of that even this morning, flogged, beaten, mocked, whipped, a, a crown of thorns upon his head, nails driven into his hands and into his feet. My youngest daughter, uh, she has been upgraded, you know, from the kind of illustration Bibles, you know, the, the kids' Bibles with pretty pictures and and, uh, you know, PG illustrations to reading, you know, the Bible that mom and dad reads. And, and I've taken her this week, Holy Week, through the, the journey of Jesus to the cross. And so she came to me a few days ago and said, Dad, you know, as South Africans, we say hectic. Dad, this is hectic. Dad, this is, this is intense. I was reading about, you know, them blindfolding Jesus and then beating him with a stick and saying, come on, prophesy. Tell us who hit you. And Jesus was silent. And so, yes, Jesus did suffer tremendously, not just on that cross, but en route to it. We know that as he hung on that cross, the only way he could take his next breath was to push himself up as his feet were nailed into that cross so, because he was hanging by his hands and, 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 and struggling to breathe. And if he wanted to take his next breath, he needed to push himself up because his arms and his hands were, were too weak. It was too painful to, and he had to take his next breath and then collapse down again. Tremendous suffering. And yet, as I mentioned, and as my daughter discovered, that Jesus was silent for so much of it. He didn't, he didn't respond back. He didn't say anything. This is profound. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was led like a lamb, silent before its shearers. But then we read here in Mark 15, he cries out. Finally, there's some sound coming out of him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that to me speaks of his pain being way more than physical in that moment. Absolutely physical pain he was enduring. But when he started screaming out, he was experiencing an emotional and a spiritual pain that we cannot even begin to imagine. He didn't cry out, my hands or my feet or my head. 
or my beard, as we read about uh, you know, them torturing him, ripping out his beard and other passages. None of that. But when God the Father turns his back on Jesus, when he looked away, in that moment, Jesus experienced pain unlike any of the physical pain he was going through in that moment. Something way worse. Separation from God the Father. Wow. Now the Bible tells us that we, you and me, we're, we're made for relationships. The ultimate relationship is a relationship with God. And you know that when you lose a relationship, when someone dies or maybe, maybe it's a breakup or a separation of some sort, we know that often that pain is way worse than losing earthly or material things or, or tangible things. And so Jesus in that moment, you know, he's not just 30 odd years old, you know, 33 on that cross and, and, uh, and had a, a, a relationship with the Father uh, in the flesh. And, and that is coming to an end. No, we're talking about God incarnate. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's experienced a relationship with the Father from eternity past. That is how long they've been together. And, and that is the, 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 the depth of the separation that he's going through. Worse than we know. And I think that the, what he's going through physically is, is a picture of what he's going through spiritually. And in many ways, it's also for us a vivid picture of, of what our sin does to our relationship with God. It, 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 it's, it's a shock effect. That's how bad sin is spiritually as we see what Jesus is going through physically. Judgment for Adam and Eve was being cast from the presence of God. They were cast away from that tree of life. And they've suffered ever since. We've suffered ever since. But Jesus came to restore that relationship. And so that tree of life for us is the tree of death for Jesus. The cross is what brings us back into a relationship. Jesus was forsaken in that moment so that we could be brought back in relationship with him. And so that brings me to the last section or the, the third section today. And that's the verse out of Luke chapter 23, verse 29. And one of the criminals who hanged there said to him, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Save himself and us? What's going on there? We read about how Jesus was taunted. They said, Come on, get down. Come and save yourself, you know. Let's see if Elijah will come and help you out. A lot, a lot of that stuff was happening. People beating him, saying, come on, prophesy, tell us who hit you. A lot of that taunting was happening. Why didn't Jesus, why didn't he just stop all of that? Why didn't he just stop everyone? Because let's be honest here, this is the Jesus, as we read through the Gospels, the Jesus who walks on water, the Jesus who calms the storm, the Jesus who feeds thousands with like a McDonald's meal equivalent, the Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead. We'll talk about resurrection on Sunday. The Jesus who performed many other miracles. If this is the Jesus that we are reading about, why did he not just intervene and stop? What was going on there? Even on the night of his betrayal, he told his disciples to put their swords away as Jesus was arrested. And, you know, Peter in classic Peter, Peter fashion pulled out a sword and chopped off the ear of one of the soldiers. And in that moment, even Jesus heals that ear. And, and, and he said to them, put your swords away. He says, you, don't you realize I can call a legion of angels in this moment to rescue me quicker than I could heal this ear in many ways. Why did Jesus not do that? With all that power at hand, what is up with the crucifixion? I was reading about the German uh, Christians a while ago when I read one of uh, Eric Metaxas' books on, on a man called Bonhoeffer. And the German Christians who sided with the Nazis, uh, they saw the cross as a sign of weakness. And so they replaced it with the swastika. And, uh, and they were right because from the incarnation, from when Jesus was born as a helpless babe, all the way to dying at the hands of humans on the cross, it was all God becoming weak. But here's the thing. It was God choosing to be weak. And the, re the cause for his weakness has to be the power of God because only God can limit God's power. No one else can limit. Only God can limit His omnipotence. And so this must be in a, a profound moment for you. If you think about Jesus dying on that cross with all the, the fact that He is God incarnate. He's fully God and fully 
Man, he didn't use his godness in that moment. He chose to restrain himself, to remain human in that moment for you and me. It was his will. John 10, 18, Jesus talks to his disciples, says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. So friends, let's not uh, give credit to mere nails in his hands or the wood that he hangs upon or the soldiers that have arrested him. Let's not tell the, you know, the story that they are the ones that kept Jesus on the cross. No, it was Jesus himself that kept him there. God himself kept him there. You see, the criminal did not realize when he shouted, save yourself and us that Jesus could not do both simultaneously. He, he couldn't do both simultaneously. If he climbed off of that cross, it would have meant crossing out salvation for us. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus in that moment was a substitute. He died in our place for our sin. We even read in the verses before, you know, even one of the criminals says, hey, he's hanging here. He didn't do anything wrong. Jesus lived a sinless life. He obeyed God the Father 100%. Perfection. Sinless. Yet the scriptures tell us that on the cross, he became our sin. Our sin came upon him. That is why the Father turned his face from Jesus. Because he could not look as a holy God upon our holiness, which was upon Jesus that was being nailed to the cross, and that was being punished. Our sin, he took the punishment for it there. And he was the perfect substitute. As I said, he was God in the flesh. In you. He lived like you and me, and yet without sin, so that he could be that perfect substitute in our place. And it's only right that he would be dying on that cross as God as well, not just as the perfect human, because every sin committed, Every sin that you commit, every sin that I commit, ultimately it's not against one another, but against God. And so it makes sense that all the sin of the world comes upon Him because all the sin was committed against Him. Can you see that He had to die? If He climbed off that cross, we would not have had an opportunity for salvation. But secondly also, He is both the one that in that moment is just because He is paying for your and my sin. But in that moment, he's also the one who can justify you and me. If a judge lets someone who committed a crime uh, against you go free without uh, uh, you know, asking for some kind of penalty, other people may call that judge a merciful judge, but you will not call him that. You will call him an unjust judge because you were left to pay. You were left to absorb the pain of the sin that was committed against you if that judge just let that person go free without any penalty. It would have cost that judge absolutely nothing, but it would have cost you a lot more. And this is not what God did. It did cost God everything. When He lets those who trust in Jesus walk free, it's because it, He paid the price. And therefore, He can justify us. He can put us in, in, in a position before Him without sin because He paid for that sin. And, and we get Jesus' righteousness, His perfect life, because on that cross, Jesus took our sin, our autonomy, our rebellion upon Him, and it was paid for in full. This is what God did for us. And so, friends, I want to encourage you, and maybe you're journeying with us as a as a. a, a a non-Christian, somebody who's still exploring the claims and the teachings of Jesus. One day, Jesus will come back because we'll figure out on Sunday that he's raised from the dead. And Jesus himself said he's coming back one day to judge the world. And on that day, friends, you will either stand before God with a receipt of his payment. He paid for my sin. I have trusted in the sacrifice of Jesus for myself. You'll stand with a receipt or otherwise you'll stand with an invoice that is due. And he, and he offers his substitutionary death in your place for your sin. It's on offer for you this morning. And I want to encourage you to say yes, to admit that you are a sinner in need of a savior and to take the gift that God is offering you in his son Jesus and in what he has done. That is why this is a good day. This is why this is a great day. Death for him means life for us. 
I want to invite you, even in this moment, to say yes to Jesus. It means admitting your need of Him, admitting your sin. You could just do that as you're watching, as you're listening. In this moment, I trust the Holy Spirit is meeting with you and that you would experience God's life. And for Christians, I want to remind you, and even for those that are journeying with us, exploring Christianity, that the reason why God did this, the reason why this is because He loves you. He loves you. Let's look at these two verses together. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. The breath of God back into us again as Jesus breathed out His last. And He took His breath again a few days later. We'll find out about that on Sunday so that He could send His Spirit. This is a profound thing. That God, who is spirit, became flesh so that you and I, flesh and bones, can receive God's spirit, can receive God's life, can be brought back into a relationship with Him because He loves you. If you hear anything this morning, it's this. God loves you and the proof of it is the cross. That's how far He went to buy you back, to pay for your sin. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, for one another. Once you take this Jesus into your life, it changes the way you live. You now live sacrificially as well. You now stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about others. And God puts His heart into your chest. Everything changes. And I trust that as you prayed that prayer this morning, maybe you've experienced God's presence and that change. We're so excited that if you did that. Won't you let us know by the means that we've said before? You know, go to our website. Uh, even now, there's a, an ability for you to be prayed for. In the bottom right of the screen, you can click on that if you need prayer. We'd love to spend some time with you. And I'm going to dismiss us now. I'm going to ask uh, you know, those who call themselves Christian to, Christians to take communion. Communion is a moment where we mem- remember the body of Jesus given for us and the blood of Jesus shed for us. And I want you to recognize that today is not just Good Friday, but as you look at what God has done for you, giving His life, that you would say, this is great. And you would celebrate that together. Find some bread, find some juice, or maybe you've got wine. And and in that moment, remember, Jesus is the bread of life and He's the living water. And as you eat and drink, remember, you feed on Him. He's the one that gives you and and has given you eternal life. Celebrate in this moment now. Let me pray. Lord, I thank You so much for the good news that Jesus loves us and that He laid His life down for us. And I ask that today would be a great day for everybody listening. And that those who have walked far from you today would say, I have drawn near. Not because of anything they have done, but because of what you have done. As I said, yes to the free gift you've offered them. Will you be with us for the rest of this day, for the rest of this weekend, Lord? Protect us and bring us back together here again Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, amen.